how dare you show up here and act like you're my dad because I have news for you, you're not. And we're back at season eight. And I know for a fact that this won't be topping anyone's list of favorite Charmed episodes, what with it simply being in season eight. And I don't think I'd include it in my top 20, but I would have to lie if I said I didn't enjoy it and indeed connect with so many of its moments. I think there's room for both of you in my life. This episode is mainly about Paige, who in a nice callback to season four is considering becoming a social worker again, and has an interview lined up at the place she used to work. Her plans have to change, however, with the arrival of none other than Sam Wilder, her biological father who she has not seen in three years since season five's Sam I Am. You are my daughter. Genetically, maybe. One of his charges, who disappeared in 1955, has suddenly resurfaced at exactly the same age, and it's safe to say a demon is involved. Said guy, named JD, after I wonder who, takes a fancy to Billy, which allowed the younger me to live vicariously through him for several minutes. Hey baby. What's shaking? The other Halliwells also have stuff going on where Piper and Leo are persuaded to go to a soothsayer about their marital problems and end up the victim of a Freaky Friday flip. Leo? Piper? <laughs> Phoebe also considers a sperm donor to make that future daughter thing happen. That reminds me, we need eggs. No oh, eggs I have, it's the sperm I'm missing. The first thing that anyone will think of when season eight is mentioned is the age old problem with Charmed and its budget. The final season had basically half the funding it normally would, which resulted in things like Daryl moving to the East Coast off screen, Leo being MIA for 10 episodes, Billy coming onto the scene to provide fresh energy and eye candy, and location filming becoming a thing of the past. And till by like season eight, we were inside the entire season. I don't think we would in it anymore. We were not allowed to play outside. But, as Joe March says in the best film version of Little Women, Necessity is indeed the mother of invention. Charmed was first pitched as a show about three sisters who happened to be witches, rather than witches who happened to be sisters, and thus what we loved about it was an emphasis on character-focused stories. While there would be a demon, warlock, or other enemy of the week, the emphasis was always on how it affected the sisters' lives. Obviously, this was a side effect of the budget never being higher than about two million per episode, which for perspective would be considered low even for an indie film. But like I said, Necessity is indeed the mother of invention. Limitations force you to get creative, and I will always appreciate the Charmed writers for doing that, and giving us stories we could connect to. And I feel that season eight with its lower budget resorted to smaller and more intimate stories to allow us to have some quality time with its main characters for one last hurrah before we bid them farewell for good. A father never stops loving his daughter. There is a demon of the week here, and the budget-friendly variety of being a humanoid in black clothes, but he's got a fun gimmick that allows for a different vanquish than usual, and he functions more as a facilitator for some strong character development. Oh, you love your father more than you think, which means you'll miss him terribly. Sam Wilder is pretty interesting in that he only appears three times on the show in remarkably different eras. His first appearance was P3H2O, where he's revealed to have been Patty's secret lover, dying at the end and seemingly going off to join her in the afterlife. Say hi for me. Given that his existence made it easier than expected to justify Paige's introduction two seasons later, it makes sense that they do some retconning to eventually have them meet. The reasons I'm not a fan of, with the elders just coming across as especially cruel for making him a white lighter again and separating him from Patty, and then assigning his daughter as his white lighter without telling either of them. It's okay. Long story short, Sam I Am is an episode I hate for reasons besides the Cole stuff. I guess so. Uh... The Elders knew better after all. There are moments, but considering they only share one scene together after finding out the other's identity, he feels like a wasted opportunity. It also had the effect of unravelling a perfectly good happy ending for the character so he could learn the same lesson over again. This appearance, however, does a lot to salvage that. Sam's basically a guardian angel, we call it a white lighter. Like pages, 
but I want to be a social worker. But that isn't what you were born to be. Sam hasn't regressed this time, and has been an active white lighter, happy and content for three years, now being able to act as Paige's guide when she needs it. An interview? Why do you need a job? You're a witch, a white lighter. This episode allows them to interact more, and acknowledge the oddity of Sam never appearing after season five. Maybe if you came around more than once every three years, you would know this about your daughter. They do have to introduce conflict for the story, but this works more in a way I'm on board with. I guess I hadn't realized how much, you know, it hurt me, the whole not showing up thing. Sam hasn't been around for three years, despite having multiple chances to be, so Paige is understandably annoyed at him showing up out of nowhere and immediately acting like a guide and a father, when she's now a more experienced white lighter. I should have come by long ago, but out of deference to your real father's memory, I... The conflict doesn't feel forced. Sam kept his distance out of respect for Paige's adoptive father, which of course Paige didn't think of, and the resentment towards Sam is also more representative of the final arc she goes through before the end of the series, which is pretty much resolved in The Young and the Restless, as I talked about in my video on that. Look, you've got to stop fighting this, Paige. You've got to stop fighting yourself. Paige could turn her back on being a witch at the start of the season, but not on being a white lighter, since she formed a connection with Billy automatically, and had to get drawn back into the magical world against her will. You're not supposed to respond to anything anymore. It's very hard not to respond to a call for help. Piper and Phoebe had something of a choice in going back to demon fighting, but Paige never did, so it's understandable that she would resent this side of her that keeps her from having as normal a life as the other two. But it's not that Paige doesn't want to help people, it's that she wants to be able to choose to do so. Which is why she set up an interview to become a social worker again, and had previously considered becoming a cop in Malice in Wonderland. In both cases, she realises that what she wants is something that she already has the opportunity to do, and her self actualization is in no longer denying one half of herself, and then realising that it is still a choice. He's not your only father, but he is still in fact your father. You're connected. At least he's a white lighter. It makes for a nice moment when she's able to save Sam by calling to him not as one white lighter to another, but a daughter calling for her father. Dad? It also adds a little bit of brilliance as to why this dude only wants future white lighters rather than current ones, since they can't be called so easily, and Paige being a charmed one, who I still insist is the most powerful of the four, allows her to free all the other victims too. And what's that? Season 8 having good continuity? My real father? The one who raised me, loved me, and took care of me till the day he died? Was a firefighter. Your dad was a fireman? There's also more continuity in the B-plot. Did Wyatt switch you guys again? No. Piper and Leo getting switched because of their marital issues sort of happened in Siren Song, where unborn Wyatt swapped their powers around to help them understand the other's lifestyle, and they previously went to a marriage counsellor in Cat House, which is referenced. Why don't you try seeing a marriage counsellor? <laughs> We've tried that once too, remember? And since this is the B-plot, I see it more as a callback and it does continue the couple issues Piper and Leo had been having since he became mortal. Every shrink wants couples to walk a mile in each other's shoes, right? This guy just did it literally. I praise Charmed for how it showed a husband and wife properly building a life together and working out their issues whenever they arose, and this is another example of that, reminding viewers that relationships are never perfect, and conflict is always going to come up, but passive aggression and dismissiveness is not the healthy way to deal with it. If nothing else, it's a significant improvement over when Phoebe and Paige swapped bodies. He's a soothsayer. He's a quack. Gotta say, Brian Krause gets Piper down perfectly. People who know what they're doing don't cause explosions. Leo has less mannerisms that are easier to imitate, but Holly Marie Combs does a good job as well. It's one thing to have my wife constantly criticize everything I do, it's another thing when you do it for my own body! Phoebe's storyline continues the saga of her angst around getting that daughter she had several visions of, and at this point she's been married a second time and had that relationship blow up in her face thanks to a lack of honesty, and said man likely being too expensive to keep for longer than six episodes. But it's a recurring thing for Phoebe to want to skip over the messier parts of life and jump straight to the finish line in the hopes of getting what she wants, and I get it here. I'm not someone who ever wants to have kids or do the whole marrying thing, unless maybe Shailene Woodley drops me a line, 
but I understand how it can sometimes feel to be clobbered and kicked in the metaphorical teeth while trying to achieve something, and wanting to see if there's another way. The last two relationships she had were Drake, who had an expiration date as soon as she got with him, and Dex, who was yet another case of magic and mortal not mixing. So Phoebe would understandably feel broken by this endless string of failed relationships, and consider other ways of making her dream happen. I can't just sit back and wait for love to find me, I gotta hurry up. But of course, she can't bring herself to give up on love. And I know from experience that when someone can't find a match, they don't really want to. What they want is outside these walls, not inside. I like this scene, where she looks at all the pictures of the families in the office and realises what she truly wants. I think it's a good way to deconstruct the typical love chaser character you get in other shows, and then move into reconstruction once Coop shows up to help Phoebe overcome her heartbreak. But speaking of heartbreak... Billy, it's not your fault. Yes it is. Billy gets a double whammy, with this being her first episode since properly realising her sister was kidnapped by demons, and the first time she loses an innocent. Should've stopped him. If you could have, you would have. It's also the only time she gets a love interest. Well, maybe it was just to meet you. JD. JD is of course the typical 1950s greaser, right down to being kidnapped literally while he was at a drive-in seeing Rebel Without a Cause. It was the middle of the flick, Rebel Without a Cause. That... JD could easily be a nod to James Dean, who he definitely resembles, and was the archetypal bad boy of the time who was really a challenge of traditional 1950s values, but also possibly to JD Salinger, author of The Catcher in the Rye, which was about such a character, and probably the first notable example in pop culture. The purpose of the bad boy is to challenge the status quo, and that's exactly what he does for Billy. Promise me something. You won't waste your whole life looking for your sister like my dad wasted his looking for me. Having just found out about her sister's kidnapping, she exhausts herself trying to find answers and forgetting about the very thing the Charmed Ones recruited her for, protecting innocence. He had nobody left. Not my mom, my brother. They said he buried me 50 years ago even though he never stopped looking for me. JD outlines a possibility that could happen if Billy lets this search for Christy consume her, and ironically urges her not to live in the past and move on. This will tie into Billy's character development later on, with her getting Christy back and realising things aren't as they should be, and the Halliwells being the family she really needed. And sure enough, it's Phoebe who comforts her after losing her first innocent in a way that's slightly reminiscent of when Piper had to deal with something similar in Astral Monkey. We can't save every innocent. We're witches, not gods. This is the Phoebe we know and love, just now mature and wiser. Sometimes you just have to let things happen in their own time, in their own way. I really love this scene, and it's a very strong performance from Kaylee Cuoco. I, I promise to protect him. Promises can be tricky. I'm also a sucker for the whole star-crossed lovers thing, which, contrary to popular belief, is when the lovers can't be together because fate rules against it. And the dynamic between JD and Billy really works for me. Just don't run away from me, I can protect you from this. I promise. Despite only having one episode together, it feels like a very developed connection, and I really feel something when he leaves her to go make his heroic sacrifice. You're here for a reason, I believe that. Well maybe it was to do this. To do good. I've even used this line on people in the past, not realising where it was from. I was lucky to know you, Billy. And one thing I like is how Charmed portrays future white lighters as not just the stock do-gooders like medics or school teachers, but also as, say, a juvenile delinquent who breaks away from the gang lifestyle, a lost young woman with a drinking problem, and indeed a greaser from the wrong side of the tracks, showing how we're all capable of good, that it doesn't matter where you come from, and how anyone can turn their life around and do the right thing. Which is why I never get tired of this charmed trope of a future white lighter seemingly dying before accomplishing the good they needed to, but being rewarded with their wings anyway. Might have taken him an extra 50 years, but I think he finally managed to prove himself a future white lighter. By saving another, you? I was worried that I wouldn't have much to talk about with regards to this episode, but sure enough, 
It's one of those low-key, brilliant, character-focused stories that gives equal and balanced screen time to not just all three Halliwells, but also to Billy and even Sam too. Not exactly sure how I fit in. It ties up the loose end that I feel was left hanging with Sam's conspicuous absence from the series, and allows Paige to make peace with him and begin to find her sense of self, as well as exploring some familiar territory with Piper and new with Phoebe, and some combination of both with Billy. I'm not supposed to be here. But you are here. Not by some strange twist of fate. I should probably stop talking now, since my credibility always goes into jeopardy whenever I praise season 8. So I'll leave you with the final scene, which I just love, for reasons already detailed. Mm -hmm.